were to decline a degree and a half, you'd, you'd be on the order of almost 100% males. So the message here is that their sex determination is exquisitely sensitive to climate. It's not just affected by, it's almost driven by. And if you don't have males, if you don't have females, you don't have a viable population. <clears throat> Here's a schematic that maybe brings this home a little bit more. Uh, this is one of the nesting beaches, or the main nesting beach at this site. If you focus on the left one first, this more or less says which parts of that nesting beach are the primary male, female, or both sex producing areas. And the reddish areas are the hotter ones that produce the females by and large. The bluer ones tend to be cooler and produce the males for the most part. The yellow ones produce both. And what this model indicates is that if you just change the July temperature by one degree, look at how that changes the thermal environment for these animals. If they don't change their individual nesting patterns, it radically changes, and certainly reduces anyway, the sites on the island that you can produce males if you put your nest in a spot. Right? And greatly increases the areas they're going to be female producing. <clears throat> I'm going to leave you with this one, which is the other way in which they could change their nesting behavior. Can they change in terms of where they place their nest? We haven't seen any evidence of that so far. We follow these individually marked females for almost 20 years, and we don't see that. It's not like they're changing with respect to uh, with time. The one thing we do see, however, that's changing dramatically is, again, something that Diane alluded to, is the nesting phenology. The nesting season is beginning Tr tremendously earlier than it used to. And here's a slide um, in a, uh, from another study population that we work at in, in Illinois with a colleague of mine that shows the onset of the nesting season in terms of Julian days. So I suppose if I was smart, I would have put that in terms of normal human days, but this is roughly uh, er, uh, June 1st. <laughs> Somewhere right around here is, is June 1st. And you can see that in the span from the late 80s when we started our studies, to now in the 2000s, the onset of the nesting season has increased, has started roughly three weeks earlier than it used to. It's a phenomenally rapid change of 20, 20 plus days in a matter of not even a, barely a generation in terms of these turtles. So what we're seeing, as our evidence suggests, is that a plasticity, that the animals are adapting in terms of their individual behavior when they come out of the water. Um, but what, I, what I'm not indicating here as well is that we now are seeing a plateau. They now somehow can't start earlier even though the climate is changing. So now we're going to see whether, what happens. But um, anyways, we're seeing some very interesting things. I'm not going to talk more about, about the science, but, but the story here is that these animals seem to be adaptable. They have been around for 250 so million years. Um, uh, but they're not unaffected by the climate change that we're seeing currently. And with that, I'm going to uh, take one from the team, keep it short. Move on. There we go. Office 2007, things are in different spots. <laughs> Well, thanks again for coming on a cold day and thanks for sticking around. Start off by, uh, take a little bit different approach again. My dad and I like to debate politics, ethics, religion, science. There's no topic out there on which he won't try to get my goat. Given my profession and because my folks recently bought the farm that my maternal grandfather grew up on, the environment is a very common theme of, in our conversations. The science of climate change comes up frequently, of course. I send my dad a copy of an editorial by Donald Kennedy, attesting to just how far the science of climate change has come in the last few years. He responds by sending me a 1960s or editorial from Science, warning society of the impending global cooling event. 
I send him a summary of the recent IPCC report. He sends me a news story on how Senator Kerry erroneously blamed the recent string of tornadoes in the southern U.S. on global climate change. It continues. More often, however, rather than trying to get me riled up, my dad is asking me if I'm sleeping okay at night. As, as a scientist that studies the causes, the patterns, and the consequences of landscape and land use change, I consider human impacts on our biosphere on a daily basis. I understand how many, the many small, seemingly inconsequential decisions that Brent talked about with development, how they scale up to affect global processes. I see how the science will never be perfect, but it's clear the direction that society must head in. And I realize that future generations may call our personal and political foot dragging a crime against humanity. But I do sleep at night. I have no problems there because I know, also know that change begins with me and I know that change begins with my dad. Today I'm going to tell you a story of one facet of my research. It also takes place in the Driftless area that Brent talks about. It links biodiversity and climate change and it's one that my dad is doing something about. I'm going, I'm going um, the Driftless area, southeast, excuse me, northeast Iowa, southeast Wisconsin, southeast Minnesota. It's a, an area renowned for its bluff land landscapes, its beautiful trout streams, and its very unique plant and animal communities. And I'm going to tell you about why we need to manage for more, more oaks in that system to make it resilient to climate change. First of all, why should you care about oak? I would argue, and others agree with me, that oaks are a foundational or keystone species in this region and actually throughout much of the forest areas of, the eastern, of eastern North America. So what's a keystone or foundational species? This was a paper published in Frontiers in Ecology and the Environment in 2005 um, by Aaron Ellison at, and his and co-authors. And in a nutshell, um, a single foundation species controls population and community dynamics and modulates ecosystem processes. The loss of foundation species acutely and chronically impacts the fluxes of energy and nutrients, hydrology, food webs, and biodiversity. We're not just talking about a single species here, we're talking about changing whole ecosystems if we lose foundation species. And there are a few here. There are a few foundational attributes specific to oak that I want to share with you. First of all, you're all familiar with the acorn it, that that's produced from oaks. They're a major food source for many mammals and birds. The red-bellied woodpecker, the tufted titmouse, the blue jay um, are examples of species that use oak, especially in the in the fall and winter months, for its to for their diets. Also, the furrowed, bo the furrowed bark that you found, find on oak, oh, excuse me, the furrowed bark you find on oak trees, and they have a very short petiole on their leaves, is really important for biodiversity as well. They provide better foraging opportunities because of their their barks. Maple barks, in comparison, are very smooth. They don't house the same insect communities. Because they have short petiole leaves, it's easy for birds to sit on a branch and pick insects from those leaves as opposed to having to hover in flight to pick leaves off of a very long petiole maple leaf. Lepidopteran larvae, you find them in greater numbers on oak leaves as opposed to maple leaves. And lepidopterans, um, those little cat caterpillar larvae that you see, are incredibly energy rich bundles for forest songbirds. Not only that, they're pretty easy for songbirds to actually forage on um, because they don't move too fast. So the, energetically, it's a really important food source. The habitat differences between oak and maple dominated areas, they extend to the forest understory. Oak canopies let more light into the understory. When you see a shift from a maple or from an oak to a maple forest, you see a 90% decrease in the amount of light reaching that understory. It translates to about 90% um, about less plant cover and 
35% decrease in the amount of leaf litter on the forest floor. That leaf litter is a really important habitat for mammals, birds, insects to live in. So you remove that and you remove those, those animal communities that depend on it. You see a 90% decrease in plant richness and cover in a maple forest as opposed to an oak forest. Not only does this have an effect on those insect, plant, bird, mammal communities, but there's also insects in, sub in nearby streams. When there's less plant cover on the, on the forest floor, you tend to see more erosion of sediment and nutrients into the stream. Those really beautiful trout streams in, in northeast Iowa without oak forest covering those slopes, those, those trout streams will be threatened by sedimentation and higher nutrient levels. In other words, many plant and wildlife species have adapted to the unique environment, environmental conditions that oak forests provide. The potential widespread loss of oak um, may lead to the decline in the critical habitat, critical habitat and the populations of these species that depend on them. Now, why am I concerned about decline and oak? The research that I'm doing in my lab suggests that we are losing oak from these regions. And you need to, under, to understand why you need to understand something about the ecology of oak. Oak are tied to disturbance. They're what we call a fire-adapted species. Over time, um, as Native Americans were inhabiting these landscapes, they used a lot of fire to improve the habitat for themselves, to increase populations of wildlife, increase the, the populations of plants that you, they used as food. Oaks over time collected characteristics that allowed them to live, to live very well in those environments with frequent fire. Then we had the Euro-Americans come in and sell this landscape. They also used a lot of fire. They harvested the oaks for wood. They grazed these landscapes with their cattle. All of those types of land uses actually benefited oak very well. They were adapted to those kind of, those kind of disturbances. What we're seeing today is something very different. We've largely eliminated disturbance from these landscapes. And while the forest survey, uh, forest survey data show that mature oaks, they still dominate the overstory in these, in these savanna and forest ecosystems. But what's missing is oak from in the understory. The land use practices today that we use in these regions, while, while um, very good for species like maple, the characteristics of oak actually, it inhibits their regeneration, so we're not seeing them replaced today as we once would have. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip a little bit here. So what does that have to do with climate change? Well, oak systems should be resilient to climate change. It should actually get easier for us to maintain this foundational species or these foundational species. There's more than one. Here are a couple of climate projections from Lewis Iverson and Anantha Prasad. And what, they're, what we're looking at here is the current distribution of forest types in eastern North America right now. And under a, a CO2 doubling scenario, how you would expect those distributions to change over time. And as you can see, at present, sort of the core area of oak is down here in the central US driftless area, we're kind of on the northern border of oak ecosystems in, in North America at this time. The maple systems, which oak are competing with, are here to the north of that area a little bit. With our changes in land use practices, it's allowed the, the maple basswood systems to push in on those oak ecosystems. Under global climate change, we should solidly be within the area of oak habitat. So these systems should be resilient to climate change. But right now we're at a critical juncture for oak. Although we have those mature oak in the overstory, we're not seeing the regeneration in the understory. Right now is when we need to think about how to change our land use and management to maintain that oak and make sure that these systems are indeed resilient to climate change. It's like I thought of this analogy this morning. It's like right now we've ordered a whole bunch of seeds from Johnny's seed catalog, but we just found out that seed 
that, um, that garden plot that we applied for in the community garden that we didn't get it. So we've got the resource and nowhere to, nowhere to plant it right now is basically where we're at. So what can you do? I want to leave this on a positive note. First of all, um, we as American society, we need to change our attitude. In this country, there is a widespread public perception that the best thing to do for biodiversity is leave it alone, just walk away. This may not always be so, and in the case of oak and oak-dependent species, properly executed management in the form of perhaps prescribed fiber, fires or even harvesting can do a lot to improve the habitat for biodiversity. With regard to the American attitude about fire, it's slowly changing, but ecologists, we would have burned Smokey the Bear at the stake years ago if we could have. <laughs> Although harvesting does not perfectly mimic the fires that these systems have adapted to in many places because of the lay of the land, the ownership, because of liability, because of financial resources, harvesting is the only option that we have. Second thing that you can do, support your local land stewardship organizations and activities. Go out and cut buckthorn, go plant trees, go cage seedlings, protect them from deer. Volunteer for a prescribed burn. If you can't do them yourself, that's okay. Donate to the natural, Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation or the Iowa chapter of the Nature Conservancy. They employ students over the summer to go and do these important activities. Third, support conservation policies such as those in the Farm Bill. Better yet, help to work towards policies that actually, that actually reward landowners, farm owners, farm operators for providing important, important ecosystem services that we in society benefit from rather than producing more commodity crops such as corn. Become a deer hunter or let hunters go onto your rural land and by all means don't feed the deer. I know they're cute, but at the, their current unprecedentedly high population levels are having dramatic negative effect on forest understory biodiversity and regenerating our oak forests. And lastly, if you own land, cooperate with your neighbors in tackling these issues. Ecosystems don't end at property lines, and if we want to make a change, our management can't end at property lines either so we need to coordinate our activity. And that means that change, change begins with you, change begins with all of us. So coming back to my dad, what about us in our debate? As I said, my folks recently bought the farm my maternal grandfather grew up on, a farm my ancestors homesteaded on in 1869. It's located on the edge of the Driftless area, just to the south of Eau Claire, Wisconsin. At the time it was settled, the land was, was covered by a mixture of prairie, oak savanna, and oak forest, and marsh. When my folks bought it, bought the 60 acres, almost all of it was being row cropped. Today, there's another 20 acres of CRP there, and that's 20 acres that won't be tilled up and put into corn this spring. On all of the acres, except those two that are too wet, my folks have planted trees. A mixture, but predominantly oak. Although these 20 acres don't look like much right now, as the trees grow, they will provide a multitude of benefits. They will stabilize the soil on this highly erodible land. They will capture excess fertilizer from running off the slopes and into the stream. They will maintain water. They will allow it to transpire to the air, so you will see less frequent flooding in that stream. They will provide habitat for the biodiversity that I mentioned earlier. They will sequester carbon from the atmosphere, capturing it into their roots, their stems, and their leaves. And someday, they will provide a hearty source of income for my niece and nephew. I encourage you to plant a tree, watch it grow, listen to the wind in its leaves, listen to the birds in its branches, embrace the annual cycles of leaf out growth and leap off. Cut a branch and count those rings. Watch, it swell, watch the stem swell through the years. A simple and a boundless beauty, a service to society. That makes me and my dad sleep at night.
Harris is our last speaker. My presentation is actually pretty brief, so we'll cruise. Um, I'm going to talk to you about my perspective on climate change, and that's the effects that it, climate change may have on wildlife health from the perspective of disease affecting wildlife. And so there's a variety of factors that affect the emergence of disease in, in wild populations and in human populations for that matter. I've listed the three that I think are the most important here and it is the focus of today is climate. We're going to talk about the ramifications for short and potentially long-term perturbations in global, global climate as they relate to wildlife health. And so why is climate and its potential change relevant to the health of wildlife populations? Well, because climate environment plays a key role in the way that hosts, which in this particular circumstance is wildlife, interact with the agents that give them cause disease in their populations. And we predict that changes in climate, in particular warming of the climate is going to change these interactions in, in four of the ways I've listed here, and this is detailed in, it with more examples in the Harvell et al. paper in Science for, from 2002, if you're interested in reading more about this. And so we're concerned about warming temperatures from the perspective of the warmer it gets, the faster disease agents tend to develop, the, the more efficiently they tend to be transmitted among hosts. Uh, we're concerned about increasing global temperatures because it relaxes the previous overwinter dormancy that was required of a lot of parasites to survive those kind of cold temperatures. And so when that overwintering is released, you have potentially continuous transmission of pathogens among wildlife populations. Changes in climate can also affect the host in one particular way it can affect it is it can change the ability of that host to resist infection by parasites by compromising its immune system, let's say, increasing its levels of stress. And then I think a key component of climate change that's been alluded to in here without respect to disease but is particularly relevant to disease is that change, changes in climate change the ge geographic distribution of organisms. And for disease, we're concerned about the distribution of the agents themselves, vectors like ticks and mosquitoes that carry those agents around potentially, and changes in where the hosts occur or don't occur anymore. So all of these factors are important for consideration of how changing climates may affect disease in wildlife populations. And what I want to do is just kind of give you snippets of examples of research that people have been conducting on either high profile species or maybe species you're not really thinking about might be impacted by changes in the climate. So avian malaria is one that people have been concerned about changes in, in temperature for a while now. Uh, this disease is introduced to the Hawaiian Islands. It's transmitted by a mosquito. And the disease is extremely strongly tied in the past to altitude as a function of temperature changes with altitude. So if we look at this conceptual model by Van Riper in 1996, with elevation you see changes in the distribution of the major players in this disease. The vectors, the mosquitoes, do well at lower altitudes, but they can persist in mid-elevation. The parasites for in the past did best at mid-elevations, and the combination of those two factors has pretty much driven a bunch of native Hawaiian birds to the extreme high altitudes in Hawaii because it's a way to escape this disease. Well, with some modeling exercises by um, Benning et al. and others um, associated with the U.S. Geological Survey, they're projecting how climate change, warming temperatures are going to change the altitudinal gradient of temperature in Hawaii. And the prediction is that the temperatures are going to bring about a release on the altitudinal limits of mosquitoes so that they're going to continue to move to higher altitudes, eliminating that niche of protection that was allowing a bunch of native Hawaiian birds to escape this disease. So there's concern that as that refuge goes away, 
these birds may not be able to adapt fast enough to this onslaught of disease that's predicted to come with this increasing altitudinal distribution of mosquitoes. Another example of this kind of change in temperature releasing um, limits to disease or uh, vector ranges is proliferative kidney disease. Some people in Switzerland have been monitoring water temperatures uh, by altitude in some lakes for the past 25 years, and they've recently seen that brown trout are dying of this metazoan disease that destroys kidneys of, of the fish. And in studying this effect, by altitude, what they found was that the low altitude populations are being heavily impacted now by this, this kidney disease. 27% of fish, it's 73% of the sites they're sampling are infected and dying of this disease, resulting from a fisherman's point of view, a 67% decline in catch. Whereas where the disease is not occurring at higher elevations, there's no disease and there's no change in catch rates. The project, the reason why they're having these new problems at these low elevations is that the water temperature is warm to the degree that the disease is able to infect and cause mortality. And so they understand the limits of the agent and the limits of that agent are being released by the change in water temperature that now makes it conducive for them to thrive in an area that they couldn't in the past. So the concern now is how long is it going to take for the temperatures in this system to increase with increasing altitude, similar to the avian malaria issue? Chytridiomycosis, many of you may have heard of. Amphibian populations at the species level even are declining globally for a variety of different reasons. One reason that appears to be playing an important role in several species populations of frogs is this parasitic fungus associated with chytridiomycosis. It is a skin disease of these animals. It invades their cells, possibly releasing toxins that are fatal to it, but for certain thickening the skin to the point where water balance is disrupted, destroying the permeability of their skin cells and the animals are dying. A long-term study in Spain that was studying amphibian populations independent of the disease and looking at their dynamics, also recording climate data in this area, have found a significant association between the significant rise in temperature in their study area over time and an increased observation of this chytrid-related disease finding a significant correlation between increasing global temperature and increasing levels of mortality due to this disease in these frogs. And then finally, something that maybe is not so much on people's radar is that of endoparasites of white-tailed deer, meningeal brainworms, and giant flukes are pretty much common in white-tailed deer, and they don't really cause that we know of any trouble to white-tailed deer, but they cause horrible problems in most other ungulates out there, moose, caribou, bison. It's one of the reasons, potentially, for the restricted overlap between white-tailed deer and a whole lot of other big ungulates, that if they get in contact with these agents that the deer can deal with, they, these other species of ungulates die. Well, there's a lot of concern that warming temperatures are going to make much more of the globe conducive for white-tailed deer population expansion. And they're already starting to see some of this. A study just published a year, year and a half ago in Wildlife Monographs studied this long-term decline in moose populations at the southern extreme of their range in Minnesota. What they found was there are a variety of factors responsible for the decline in this moose population. But the key one that's causing most of the mortality that they're seeing is that they're seeing a lot more white-tailed deer in that area, and that's coming along with an increased level of mortality due to these pathogens. These moose don't do well when they're infected with these pathogens. For the most part, they die. So the source is a new neighbor in the neighborhood, and it's bringing with it something that is one, apparently, 
of the major drivers for the decline in this moose population. This is projected to only get worse as deer are able to expand further north in overlap with species more of the moose habitat and with caribou, who also suffer severe neurological disease when they're faced with these types of endoparasites. So there's many more examples that I could go through that project climate change is going to affect the host, the agent, their distribution, their ecology that we should, that we as disease people are concerned about with respect to the health of wildlife. And that kind of to sum all up is a function of the fact that when we study disease, we often think of disease in, in what epidemiologi epidemiologists call the epidemiological triangle, where inextricably intertwined are the host, which in our case is the wildlife, the agent, which are the pathogens and parasites that cause disease, and then in that third key part of that triangle is the environment. The environment brings hosts and agents together, they change the susceptibility of hosts to disease, and they change the ability of the disease agents to cause disease. So from a wildlife disease person's perspective, changes in climate are a key driver in understanding and predicting the future health of wildlife populations. I think I'll just kind of wrap it up right there. Thanks. No problem. Well, um, I just wanted to remind you, uh, at the back of your Flyway magazine is selling issues and subscriptions, so don't forget about that. And the M Shop at 1045 is um, our next, uh, not a panel, I don't think, but our next um, program, Farmscape. And uh, then at 1 o'clock,